hearing, basically the assumption is that if you see some some structure in an image, then basically you can see it in other uh, in other parts of the image. So that's why you apply convolution. So the number of weights is not uh, proportional to the number of pixels in the image, but some fixed size. So the complexity as a result will go <coughs> much slower than in the fully connected network in the input size, the number of pixels. And basically this looks like a common tool that is used in computer vision and is working very well. State of the art the results in almost everything. So just an example, uh, if you see what the neural network learns on image classification applications. So the first layer contains very simple features, very simple filters like edges, corners. So edges second layer will contain some more complicated structures like corners. Third layer will already contain some more complicated structures like you can see here, some even human faces for example. Fourth layer and fifth layer, basically if you, the deeper you go, the more complex features become and basically you can actually show there is this figure of the grandmother neuron that will be a neuron in the, in the human brain or an artificial neural network that reacts only when you see your grandmother. So maybe it's a little bit of exaggeration, but probably this is how it looks like in convolutional in neural networks as well. Okay, so now back to the main problems of this talk. We want to go to non-Euclidean structure data. So the two prototype objects that I would like to deal with will be manifolds in class. So manifolds are a good model for 3D shapes. So they represent boundary surfaces of three-dimensional volumes. And graphs, basically, you know that graphs can measure any kind of interaction between abstract objects, social relations, uh, connections, you name it. Basically, even high-dimensional data can be modeled as kind of graph that represents uh, some local, lower dimensional structure. So the first, I would like to talk about, I would like to talk about uh, spectral methods. So I think I will need to remind you what is a relation because it will be used prominently at least in the first part of the talk. Uh, and you will see that it's a very important and very useful operator. So just a recap of probably content of very basic lectures in vector calculus, calculus 2. Okay, so what is the notation? Assume that you are given a scalar field okay, function that here is represented by colors. It's a temperature in this room. Okay, so what is the gradient of this function? So the gradient of the function is a vector field. You can represent it as arrows at each point. Okay, so the arrow points to the direction of the steepest increase of the function. So it has a direction and length. The length tells you how much the function increases locally at that function at that point. And the direction tells you in which direction you need to go to get the steepest increase. What is the divergence? So if you are given a vector field, the divergence of this vector field is the density of flux that flows out of infinitesimal volume or area around the point. So roughly speaking, it allows you to distinguish between sources and sinks of field. An important result, which is a kind of conservation property called the divergence theorem, tells you that if you take your vector field and you look at its flow through the, the boundary of some, some volume or area in your domain, it will be equal to the integral of the divergence of the field in the domain. So roughly speaking, it's net flow flows outside of the volume will be equal to the number of sources and sinks to the, all the sources and sinks of the field sum up. And basically by virtue of this theorem you can also see that the location that we define here as minus the versions of the gradient, usually in physics you will see it defined as plus, you can interpret it as the difference between f at the point x and the average of f on in the infinitesimal sphere around the point x. Now, this is quite a remarkable result because, for example, in the Cartesian case, you know that Euclidean Euclidean oplation is just sum of second order derivatives, right? F double X plus F double Y, right? So basically this result tells you that it should be rotation invariant. 
in Cartesian coordinates, it's not easy to see it, but it is a rotation invariant. Okay, maybe a better way to see it is to look at the discretization. So this is how you discretize the rotation in 1D on a regular grid, so single central second order derivative. And you can see immediately basically up to normal normalization, it's the value of the function at the point i minus the average at the neighbors. Here the neighbors are just two points to the left and to the right. The two needs will be four points. So that's the geometric interpretation of the operation. Now it appears that basically this need to look at the differences between the value of the function and its surroundings are so ubiquitous that you will find rotation everywhere in mathematical physics equations. It describes in equations that describe heat propagation, waves, quantum mechanical phenomena, you name it. Basically it's totally ubiquitous. Let me just give you one example. So this is the heat equation. Okay. So what is written here? Basically it encodes the Newton's law of cooling. Okay, so F is the temperature of an object at a point in space and time. Okay. So Newton's law of cooling tells you that the range, the, the rate of change of the temperature of an object, which is temporal rate to the left, left hand side, is proportional to the difference between its own temperature and the temperature of the surrounding. Okay? So that's exactly the notation. If you bring up, if you break up your your, uh, your space into tiny infinitesimal volumes, you basically look at the temperature at the point and surrounding, that will be exactly written as the notation. The proportion coefficient is called the thermal diffusivity constant. Okay? That's the simplest version of the heat equation that is called homogeneous and isotropic, or this conductivity properties independent of the position and the direction. We'll see a more complicated version where we also introduce an isotropy later on. <coughs> Another example, wave equation. So here the wave is modeled as a displacement of masses connected with a system of springs. Okay? Basically the, what is written is a kind of equilibrium of forces. So basically we have the acceleration which is the second temporal derivative of F and by Newton's second law it's proportional to the net force that is in this case is expressed by Hooke's law that covers the behavior of springs and you can write it in this way V in this case is the wave speed that is taken squared 